Hello everyone, welcome back. Today is uh, the second lecture and we shall continue about uh, our introduction of uh, this course and RF uh, systems, RF applications in general. Uh, today we will give a brief uh, historical overview and perspective of uh, RF electronics, okay, how we are where we are and where we had started. So, we will continue from where we had left last lecture okay, and there will be some slides that uh, will be uploaded and shared, but today again we will start uh, using the whiteboard. So, over to the whiteboard please. So, in the last lecture we had given the outline of the course what we are going to talk about and uh, different frequency bands and what are the applications of those frequency bands is also what we talked about. Okay. And today we will start a little bit of historical overview of this uh, RF. Uh, you know these devices in a way. Okay, we have to keep in mind that most of this progress had happened uh, during, just before, during, and after World War II, and then it caught up. You know, it exploded after that because World War was very important turning point for this development of RF system, microwave systems, and it all started with vacuum tubes. All of you know that vacuum tubes were the pre precursors before transistors or solid state devices had come to the scene. Vacuum tubes were very widely used, they are very successful okay, until they were largely replaced by solid state transistors. Okay. So, vacuum tubes we have to go, we have to for you know legacy sake we have to actually revisit some of the things of vacuum tube. We need to understand that the first vacuum tube was actually invented in 1906 okay, by a person called Lee Forrest okay. and it was a triode vacuum tube and basically a vacuum tube is such that you essentially have two electrodes all of you you know you talk about you read about it in your 12th class and then you have this uh, tube or glass for instance wh which is pumped down you know it is vacuum in a way and there are filaments that are coming out here okay and you apply a very high voltage okay and until there is emission of electrons from one electrode you know if you have very high voltages the electrons will be emitted but the field here will accelerate the electrons okay they will they will be accelerated and to get amplification of the signal or you can have a third kind of a terminal here. Okay. The third terminal it is not just a diode it can be even a triode where you have a, a third terminal using which you can actually uh, decide you know the amplification and you can uh, amplify the signal in a way. Okay. Uh, so, the you so this, this vacuum tube concept led to the emergence of a large category of vacuum devices. Okay. Uh, there are many many vacuum devices that were invented and these were used for both RF signal uh, generation and they are also used for RF signal uh, amplification. So, generation means that of course, you are generating an RF signal from a DC bias and amplification means that you have a small signal which is amplified into a large magnitude signal. Okay. So, both of these are very important RF generation and RF amplification and both of these tasks could be done by vacuum tubes. Okay. Um, so, I told you here that there is a high field applied, but for instance there could be heating. You can heat the cathode, okay. you can heat the cathode and that cathode will start emitting electrons and you have a field anyways that will attract the electrons and it will go to the other side. Okay. That is the basic operation of the vacuum tube and you have all the designs. People even tried pentrode a tetrode with 4 electrodes, four, 5 electrodes not very successful, but triode and diodes were extensively used. Okay. Triodes enabled signal amplification and diodes were just 2 terminal devices. Okay. And uh, if you look at the schematic diagram there is this anode for instance okay. and then there is this cathode for instance. Okay. There is anode and then cathode and then there is inside an enclosure. Okay. And, uh, you have plus minus okay it's called v grid that you're applying okay and uh, oh sorry this is your cathode okay i missed, missed this is a cathode this is the control grid this is the control grid okay this is the control grid this is your cathode and this is your anode okay and this anode is connected to uh, plus minus this is a V plate okay, the plate voltage. So, this is your anode plate basically okay. and electrons are all going from here to the other side. So, there is from here to the other side. Okay. 
So there is a control grid, the control grid can actually modulate the signal that is why you can amplify. The cathode and the anode you know they are heated and I am um, sorry the, the, the cathode is heated and it generates all the electrons per thermionic emission, they are accelerated by the field, the plate voltage, they go to the other side and while they go the control electrode for instance in a triode can actually modulate the signal you can get amplification. So these vacuum tubes were largely successful but they were also very bulky, big, they were also the lifetime was not very much okay they could they get damaged easier and they were very big they were quite you know relatively big and bulky. So then they were the introduction of semiconductor okay the introduction of semiconductor transistors largely overtook and replaced all the vacuum tubes okay and that is because semiconductor devices are very compact okay they are very tiny extremely tiny you know that you can have billions of transistors millions and billions of transistors in a just a small die you know that is in it is incredible okay. Transistors also they are uh, in a large volume when you talk about their cost is quite low the solid state transistors okay. You can make integrated circuits I see using transistors very easily uh, and you can make very complicated circuit okay using transistor and so you can actually consume low power when you talk about millions of transistors or even you know hundreds of transistors for instance you are actually overall consuming less power and uh, the vacuum tubes are not only bulky which have poor lifetime but they also cons consume very high power you, you, you generally consume very power okay. Transistors also have very high efficiencies and so they can actually uh, you can operate on low voltage supplies and uh, the thing is that you waste less heat uh, than equivalent vacuum tubes okay. And also you can operate them on low voltage I told you they are also more safe okay and they have uh, you can actually uh, match them you know impedance match can be done without much difficulty okay. They are also very rugged and their lifetime is also very large okay. Vacuum tube disadvantage I told you they are bulky they are not suitable for portable uses they are very heavy they need a very high operating voltage they generate a lot of waste heat and they are lot uh, less power efficient okay. And, uh, they, they can damage sooner you know so they are not that very great devices. However, semiconductor devices have some disadvantages and vacuum tube devices okay vacuum tube devices do have some advantages okay they have some advantages they have some pros and semiconductor devices like transistors like FETs or BJTs they also have some disadvantages compared to vacuum tube. So, what are the disadvantages of semiconductor devices because semiconductor devices are everywhere I am talking about RF okay I am not talking about low power logic memory processing or I am not talking about a power switch I am talking about RF electronics in general. Semiconductor transistors I will just call them transistors are most widely used RF devices and not vacuum tubes okay vacuum tubes are not completely out of the market by the way vacuum tubes are not completely out of the market even today into 2023 vacuum tube has a fair market share although it may be much much smaller than transistor but it has a fair market share and actually the market share for vacuum tubes is actually increasing in a way okay. So the vacuum tubes have not completely gone obsolete they are very useful okay they are very useful in certain application which transistors cannot do or it will be very expensive or complicated for transistors to do. Can you give me an example for instance okay vacuum tube there are many kinds of vacuum tube one vacuum tube is a magnetron a magnetron is like a cavity. Uh, where you know you have a cavity and then you have uh, a metallic anode that is I cannot draw properly but I can sh share the slide okay and you have a metallic anode which is uh, in a uh, in design in this fashion and there is there is a magnetic field that uh, runs through this core and there is electric field that runs perpendicular to the magnetic field and it can actually generate RF signal okay it can generate RF signal from a DC bias from a DC bias it can generate RF signal and it can generate kilowatts of signal at a very 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 low cost okay. The cost per kilowatt is so low that it is almost literally impossible for semiconductor devices to replace the magnetron in application where magnetron is needed. So if you need to generate say 1 kilowatt of RF signal at say 2.5 gigahertz at 2.5 gigahertz you need to generate 1 kilowatt of RF power in an RF signal semiconductor devices even silicon which is the cheapest of all material semiconductor material even if you use silicon devices your cost will be significantly high. But the magnetron can give this 1 kilowatt device at a ridiculously low price unbeatable even by silicon RF devices 
and so magnetron is the RF generator in your house oven, microwave oven. In your microwave oven which you turn in the morning to warm up food you know frost food and all that microwave oven actually uses a magnetron you know to give you 1 or 2 kilowatt of power at around 2, 2.4, 2.5 gigahertz which is almost there in every household you know microwave. So, that is a magnetron it is very 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 improbable that a semiconductor device will replace the magnetron. So, this is a vacuum tube ok. So, this market is there it is growing then there is many many kinds of vacuum tube there is one magnet uh, vacuum tube called clistron ok. There are also more different types of clistrons and these are also vacuum tube devices this can amplify clistron can for instance amplify an RF signal ok. Its operation is more detailed this course is not about vacuum tube so we shall not discuss the operation of clistron or magnetron in you know in general clistron has a this uh, you basically have a DC bias and you electrons you have the electrons flowing just as I described, but you introduce RF signal in between uh, ok. Uh, it is in a cavity called a buncher cavity and then you let them go and then you catch them in a catcher cavity you amplify the signal you know you oppose the signals that are out of phase and you reinforce the signals that are in phase clistron can amplify signal in the range of hundreds of kilowatt tens to hundreds of kilowatt ok at, at microwave frequencies something which is very very difficult or unlikely or expensive with a traditional semiconductor transistor. So, wherever there are applications that need tens of kilowatt or hundreds of kilowatt of microwave power amplification clistron is used not semiconductor transistor there is no semiconductor transistor that can probably you know give you an output power of say 10 kilowatt you know very unlikely ok very very unlikely and very expensive. So, clistron can do that rather uh, with much much less cost and you know effort. So, clistrons are used in deep space communication uh, in there is clistrons in this uh, Fermi lab I think in this in this particular accelerators and all kinds of application that need very large high power microwave power amplification ok. So, what I am trying to say is that vacuum tubes are not out of fashion they are very much there. However, the dominant portable handheld electronics radars most of the common radars, but vacuum tubes are also used in radars many of the times, but in general uh, satellite communication all the portable gadgets they all use transistors because of the advantages I discussed already ok. So, in this context it is very important it is very useful to read a book called the idea factory it is a popular science book anybody can read it its writer is I think Joe Gartner ok. Please read this book called idea factory and you will get a very good idea of how in US the Bell labs actually pioneered many of these technologies from 1930s to 1950s that accelerated the pace of development of humankind beyond what was probably expected ok. It is crazy we should read this book idea factory to understand how many of this electronic revolution device RF device revolution took place at that time ok. All right that being said transistors are widely used and they are the dominant market today because of how handheld portable electronic gadgets are increasing uh, radar satellite communication they are all much increasingly dependent on transistor. Now, apart from transistors there are also two terminal diodes ok. Apart from transistors there are also two terminal diodes all of these are semiconductor devices and two terminal devices ok or diodes can be typically that are used for RF that are used for RF could be typically classified into three categories. One is your transferred electron devices such as the gun diode, one is the avalanche transit time devices which is the impact diode all of these are used to generate RF signal not amplify. You can amplify also, but it is uh, not good ok it is not good uh, we will try to see why this is not good in later lectures, but they are useful for generating RF signal and the third is your tunnel diodes such as resonant tunneling diodes for instance Esaki diodes ok. This is these are useful for RF uh, signal generation, but tunnel diode is less successful uh, practically speaking, but there are still many many papers that are published every month on this, but practically speaking tunnel diodes are relatively less successful impact diodes are pretty successful they are useful for in many cases they are useful for generating RF power in the military sector TED also have been used, but transit time devices have been more successful ok. These are diodes in um, the RF domain you have to understand that RF signal is generated RF signal is amplified transmission received of course, and transmission receiving will be done by antenna 
uh, electromagnetic and antenna theory that is not a part of this course at all. But once the same thing signal is received, it has to be it is a very very low magnitude, so it has to be amplified. So, you have a low noise amplifier for instance, when you send the signal you have to boost the power and send it because there will be distortion and interruption anyways. So, you have to use a power amplifier when you are transmitting the signal and you have to use a low noise amplifier when you are receiving the signal ok all these are semiconductor devices by the way. So, this all actually depend on transistors ok. So, it is very important that we uh, understand what kind of transistors are typically used I already discussed that in the outline. So, we have bipolar devices such as BJTs and HBTs ok and then we have MOSFET, LDMOS ok in silicon, we have gallium arsenide based MESFET ok. Then we have uh, gallium arsenide or indium phosphide based HEMT ok, this category 3,5 semiconductor. Then we have uh, gallium nitride HEMT. These are the commercial RF device technology especially for uh, power amplifier, low noise amplifier ok. Of course, LD, LDMOS is also for power amplifier and of course, CMOS RF is used in all other you know low power RF uh, mixers, synthesizers and oscillators etcetera etcetera ok. But uh, bipolar devices are also used by the way and we will see where and how bipolar devices for instance bipolar devices can give you much higher gain ok, gain for instance. So, they, they are useful for certain things. Now, <coughs> how do an RF system designer or a circuit designer choose what device to choose? Why not use gallium nitride? Why use a gallium arsenide MOSFET? Or why use a indium phosphide PHEMT? Why not use an LDMOS? So, that decision is not only technical, but it is also non technical. Both of them, technical and non technical reasons are there, and the company or the industry that is working on them, that also will have a call. Uh, the non technical reasons are, for instance, uh, the time to develop the technology, time to market, TTM, time to market, the cost that will take you will in the cost that will be needed the volume and the scalability what is the volume you are looking at are you looking at just very small volume but very high priced something in needed in the military or space low volume but very high cost as opposed to something that is very low cost but it has to be large volume millions of people are wanting that so, then the, the choice of this technology could be very different ok the choice of this technology could be different so time to market the cost the scalability the volume the market uh, the market requirements and the market pull what is the market sentiment which way the market is leaning ok and the power supply VDD what kind of power rails are available. I just cannot have a design just because um, if I do not know what is the power supply I will I will be provided with in that application I am going to build a device for a radar I need to know what power supplies the radar manufacturer or the radar system will offer me ok. So, the power supply is a very important thing whether I can get a negative bias or along with a positive bias or will I only get a single polarity bias. So, sometimes some of these devices need a negative voltage to turn them off. So, you need two polarity, you need two polarity of signals or voltages one is a negative polarity one is positive polarity. In some chips or in some designs you only have positive polarity. So, you need to know that whether I shall get the negative polarity. If the designer says no, you will have only single polarity positive voltage then you cannot work with depletion mode devices. Because depletion mode devices need a negative voltage to turn the device off, threshold voltage is negative. So, you need a double polarity power supply VDD, I mean not VDD, the power supply. So, all these things actually are non technical reason to that will dictate significantly what kind of device topology and technology you are choosing. The technical reasons are very simple, uh, there is output power, ok, what kind of output power, output power density your technology offers, there is power added efficiency this is you can say efficiency it is a very very and most I would say the most important parameter in cell phone handheld cell phone ok power this efficiency will directly affect the battery life of your cell phone ok. But the cellular back end you know the structure the infrastructure for instance the base station or the tower the cell phone tower there the power added efficiency is important but other factors also could be important for instance ok. Then there is gain this is suppose output power, this is efficiency, this is gain. Oh, gain is super important. Of course, you need to have a good gain, ok. For low noise amplifier, if you are going to use in noise, then your noise is a very important parameter, ok. And noise is quantified by say noise figure NF, ok, noise figure. Then there is uh, linearity. In very short, linearity basically will tell you 
how uh, badly or how not so badly is your primary signal affected by nearby signals. So, you are sending a signal at 2.5 gigahertz, is it getting distorted by a signal at 2.55 gigahertz or 2.6 gigahertz okay? or 2.45 gigahertz, there could be another signal, they should not be affecting your primary signal, otherwise your signal will be distorted and you will have large non-linearity okay? or you could waste up. So, whenever you send a signal at 2.5 gigahertz, there could be second harmonic at 5 gigahertz, there could be third harmonic at 7.5 gigahertz, these are harmonic omega, 2 omega, 3 omega harmonics and inherently because transistor is a non-linear device, you lose some power in the third harmonic for instance, okay? second or third harmonic. You do not want that you lose more power in the third harmonic, okay? so that, that comes in linearity and linearity is quantified by different, uh, different uh, parameters. For instance, in cell phone world, people talk about something like adjacent channel, channel uh, power ratio ACPR or EVM error vector magnitude, uh, you people talk about output power mod, uh, intermodulation product. Okay? Uh, so, many, many parameters are there to me, but linearity, noise, gain, efficiency, output power and of course, the die size, okay? the die size and the cost I told you all those things also matter, but these are the technical specs okay? uh, for if you want to make an RF uh, power amplifier for instance, these are the things that people will talk talk about. Okay. Now, <clears throat> just to give you an historical perspective, of course, silicon was the first uh, technology to get uh, more you know mature or it was developing fast. So, uh, Bell Labs was invented, uh, Bell Labs had invented the silicon. So, if I take a timeline of the historical development of say um, silicon, silicon device technology for RF, then in I can say that in 1950s around that time, Bell Labs invented the BJT and then around 1947 they invented the BJT and in 1950s they invented the MOSFET, although the MOSFET patent was filed actually in 1939 or something, but people invented the MOSFET. Then in 1969, okay, uh, Hitachi, the company Hitachi, it invented the vertical MOSFET, power MOSFET, vertical power MOSFET. Okay. Vertical power MOSFET is also was also useful for RF, but it is not so widely used these days, although it is there still there. And at the same time, they introduced DMOS, DMOS stands for diffuse MOSFET. Uh, people introduced the concept of self aligned gate, okay. your gate can be self aligned without doing a separate litho. Uh, and then in 1974, okay, in 1974, Sony and Toshiba, the Japanese companies. Sony and Toshiba, they started manufacturing amplifiers, transistor amplifiers with power MOSFETs. Transistor amplifiers, they started manufacturing with power amplifiers. Okay? And then 1977, 1977 is when LDMOS was invented. Now, there are many claims, uh, Hitachi claims that it has developed it, but even Motorola claims that it has developed it, but maybe at the same time, you know, Hitachi, Motorola. Okay? It was developed around 1977. Okay, and then 1980s or early 1980s, and and also early 1990s. Okay, 1990s, early 1990s and 1980s. Uh, what happened is that start of silicon germanium HBT. Okay, and at the same time, people were talking about RF PJT with high power, high power RF BJT. Okay? People started to talk about and also they understood the power and other disadvantages of the same thing. Okay? <coughs> and then in 1995, first 2G cell phone net network was launched, cellular network, 2G cellular network and LD MOS technology became very widely used they became very widely used as an RF power amplifier in the mobile networks going from 1 megahertz to around 3 gigahertz. RF power amplifier is the most battery draining component in your cell phone and 2G cellular network was launched in 1995 with LDMOS was most widely used and then we are talking about 2012 and beyond till today. Uh, LDMOS is the dominant LDMOS is the dominant device technology used in cellular 
infrastructure when I say cellular infrastructure I mean the base station the cell phone towers in cellular infrastructure LDMOS is most widely used it is uh, for 4G 5G communication etc. So, LDMOS is very widely used ok. So, this is and there are many other intermediate steps also but this is a broad historical overview of how the silicon device technology for RF electronics went by ok. Then we have compound semiconductor ok I will come to compound semiconductor but compound semiconductor historically meant the 3 5 semiconductors compound semiconductors 3 5 semiconductor basically is the gallium arsenide family. So, you have gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide, indium arsenide you can mix match all of this then there is this gallium phosphide, indium phosphide, aluminum phosphide you can actually mix and match all of this lot of permutation and combination will come up in the alloy. This is the 3 5 family you have mesfets, you have hemps ok. So, this compound semiconductor family uh, if I draw a timeline then actually although the theory was uh, developed by uh, people even like Shockley for instance and then people like Herbert Cromer who was a pioneer in the developing the theory of this heterojunction devices these are all mostly heterojunction devices ok um, except mas MASFET is not a heterojunction device it's just a homo you know you know just a just a um, gallium arsenide MASFET is not a heterojunction device but many of these are heterojunction device they are all compound semiconductor devices by the way. So, <coughs> they developed the theory in 19 you know 50s 1960s, but the problem is you have to develop the material it is called growing the material. Growing very good gallium arsenide or say indium phosphide was not easy and growing and so the technology was not developed enough to deposit or grow high quality material because most of these functionalities can be realized only if the material is of really high quality that means the defect density the quality of the crystal should be very high and that was a technological challenge people did not invent or did not achieve that kind of uh, material system deposition technique until 1960s, 70s and in 80s. In 1980s people were able to grow really high quality compound semiconductor crystals ok. Until then the development was not as much they were doing it the two most important techniques were MOCVD stands for metal organic chemical vapor deposition and another technique is MBE molecular beam epitaxy they can actually grow one atomic layer at a time one atomic layer at a time they can grow and these are ultra you know they are vacuum high vacuum system MB is an ultra high vacuum system MOCVD is also a high vacuum system and you can deposit one atomic layer at a time and these are very complex system and it took 20 30 years for people to actually develop and build these systems and once they were built people could get very high quality crystals ok and it should be remembered that once they were able to grow very high quality crystals with uh, MO MB and especially MB initially in 1980s people were able to do things or realize things experimentally that were theoretically predicted but experimentally were not possible to realize and once they were able to do this experimentally with the help of MB they were waiting for these tools to be developed then many Nobel prizes were actually achieved Nobel prizes were uh, obtained or gotten by people because there are things like uh, quantum Hall effect ok. Quantum Hall effect depends on a material system which is extremely pure and for that in you need gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide material system only MOCVD could grow that at back at the time even MOCVD on MB can do that now even MOCVD can do that. So, quantum Hall effect fractional quantum Hall effect integer quantum Hall effect many Nobel prizes were actually achieved because people could do experimentally many of these things that were not possible earlier. But now for technology in 1970s early 1970s I would say people did RF gallium arsenide BJT gallium arsenide RF BJT which was a failure because it did not offer any advantage it was not a very good device. In mid to late 1970s this was early 70s now in mid to late 1970s there was an advent of MBE primarily and also MOCVD these tools were developed in mid to late 1970s and people were able to develop gallium arsenide MESFET. MESFET stands for metal semiconductor field effect transistor very powerful device extremely good at that time you know people could get that oh this is an awesome device. 1978 
is when people demonstrated the concept of modulation doping. We will see what modulation doping is. Okay. People demonstrated the concept of modulation doping using compound semiconductor heterostructures and they made what is called a MOTFET, a modulation doped FET or a high electron mobility transistor called HEMT. Okay. They could make it. They could make it uh, in 1978-1980 in that time frame. In 1980s, early 1980s for instance, people made L gas, aluminum gallium arsenide, indium gallium phosphide, HBT for RF application, heterojunction bipolar transistor. At the same time, people used, people matured of the gallium arsenide MOSFET, people matured the gallium arsenide MOSFET and they put it in low noise amplifier LNA for satellite, for TV broadcast for instance for TV broadcast, for satellite okay, uh, and they could give for instance 1 watt or less than 1 watt of power at 1 gigahertz or some gigahertz. Okay. So, gallium arsenide and MOSFETs were used in uh, TV broad broadcast satellite communication in 1980s, late 1980s at the same time HBT technologies also came up. Okay. In late 1980s, in late 1980s p hemps came up, p hemp starts for stands for pseudomorphic hemp. we will come to that. It is a more advanced version of HEMT, it could give extremely high performance in terms of frequency and power. But all of these technologies were largely disrupted in 1990s, mid 1990s by the advent of gallium nitride HEMT. That is not to say that today P HEMTs or MOSFETs, gallium arsenide MOSFETs are not used, no they are also used today in many applications uh, because they are relatively cheaper than gallium nitride, they are also go into many strategic application, but by and large gallium nitride hemp is largely displacing the P hemp's MOSFETs and uh, gallium arsenide mod, you know hemp's. Gallium nitride hemp was a disruptive technology that you know changed the paradigm at that point. Okay. And by 2000, from 2000s we have commercial devices of GAN RF hemp and today we have a very mature gallium nitride RF hemp where you can actually buy 1 kilowatt of GAN hemp a gal hemp that can give you 1 kilowatt of power at say 2 gigahertz except that you cannot buy them because they are military and so they are not uh, they are prohibited to be imported uh, they are exported by US for instance US sells this kind of devices but they will not allow India to buy it for instance okay, or other countries. So, there is a necessity for indigenous gallium nitride technology to be developed. Okay. So, this in a nutshell is about uh, today's course okay, today's lecture. So, we will conclude today's lecture with this uh, in mind that there was a historical uh, how silicon devices and how compound semiconductor devices have evolved over the last several decades. We are not discussing the specific of the details of devices here because that is what we will do in the course, but I will show you some slides in the next lecture uh, in general about whatever we talk today and we will set the stage for discussing heterojunction devices going ahead. because. Uh, we still have one or two more lectures to actually get a more closer or better feel for where RF devices are used. You know, we'll come to a little bit more. You know, things things like we'll go through like a basic transceiver chain, for instance, or we'll go through some uh, pictorial representations of where the market is for gallium nitride device versus gallium arsenide device. Uh, why? Wh what are system designers looking for in a cell phone power amplifier or in a radar? We will use a combination of slides and whiteboard to discuss some of the things. I will use images that are available free in the internet okay, and I will uh, we will we'll continue from the from there in the next class. Okay. So, thank you for your uh, time.